The Last of Us Part 2 was, in my opinion, a masterpiece. It has a well-crafted story that, whilst divisive for refusing to play it safe, resonated with a lot of people, including myself. Its gameplay is superb, with a whole heap of customization options to play it your way, and well thought out difficulty settings that make the transition up the ladder from the easiest to the hardest doable if you spend the time to master the game. And on many levels, it's a technical marvel. But it's not even four years old yet, and a remaster has recently dropped. Surely this is unnecessary, since the difference in graphics is hardly noticeable at all, and it's already had a 60fps patch for the PS5. Well, just like with the remaster of the original, the point here is to upgrade it for the new console. In both cases, work on the remaster appears to have begun almost immediately after the release of the original, knowing that it was the end of that console generation and this game would be one of the last on the old console before the new one dropped. The PS4 released just 5 months after The Last of Us came out on PS3. The PS5 released the same amount of time after Part 2 came out for PS4. The development cycle for both games will have included a significant period of time at the end where they knew a new console was coming and had access to developer kits for it. Like the remaster of the original, although there are some graphical enhancements, the main improvements to the game will be felt in the technical enhancements for the PS5 system. Graphical improvements are becoming an area of diminishing returns, and although some games will continually push the envelope to some degree, the idea that a remaster means graphics is, in my view, a misconception. One of the same ideas that leads some people to dismiss games without photorealistic graphics as not good, when art direction is far more important. The Last of Us Part 2's remastering means proper 4K fidelity and 1440p performance settings, with the option for unlocked frame rates if your television supports that, rather than just a toggle between the 30fps of the PS4 edition and the 60fps of the initial PS5 patch. It means that you can feel the haptic feedback, most noticeably in the resistance of the triggers when you fire guns, especially in drawing the bow, that change how shooting feels. Crucially for speed and challenge runners, it means massively improved loading times. My one and only gripe on this particular front is the lack of the arc reticle for the bow from part one. For me, for me that was always so much easier to shoot accurately with and I much prefer it. Other enhancements include the import of additional accessibility settings from the part one remake, such as audio descriptions in cutscenes, expanding what was already a very impressive suite of accessibility options. Other features from part 1 now in part 2 with the remaster include the speedrun mode, the additional customization options in the photo mode, the ability to watch the cutscenes in the extras menu, director's commentary for the cutscenes, and unlockable character and weapon skins. If you've never played The Last of Us Part 2 before and are buying it for the first time on PS5, this makes getting the remastered edition for £50 or $50 US a no-brainer. Unless, of course, you can find a copy of the PS4 version for half that price, for example second-hand, and then pay £10 for the upgrade. Either way, the whole experience on PS5 will be a better one than that on PS4. And if you are considering the game for the first time, and are looking for a more in-depth review of the things not exclusive to the remaster, i.e. the story and the gameplay, then I covered that in my retrospective on the game's two-year anniversary. That video is linked in the description, and there are warnings before any spoilers should you wish to avoid them. If you're not new to The Last of Us Part 2, then whether the game is worth the upgrade price is a slightly different question. If you're the kind of person who only plays through linear, story-based games once, or at least replays them rarely, then unless the new game modes, which we'll come to in a moment, appeal to you, the answer is no. But if you replay it regularly, whether to speedrun it, to beat permadeath mode, to spend lots of time in photo mode, or just for the enjoyment of the gameplay, then once more, this is in my view a no-brainer. All of those experiences will be enhanced, and the £10 price tag is standard for these kind of first-party Sony PS5 upgrades. Once you've upgraded, the process of carrying over your saves is simple. Go to the Story menu and choose Import Save. Importing your most recent save from the PS4 version will make all of your trophies from that version pop again for the remaster. So if you're a trophy hunter, you may want to avoid doing that. Otherwise, you get an extra Platinum trophy in an instant. One thing to be aware of is that although your save and your trophies carry over, your settings do not. So if you've customised various options in the game, whether that be accessibility options like the HUD colour or more general ones like aim sensitivity, you'll have to set them all up once again. There also appears to be an issue of those settings resetting themselves if you flick between game modes, which can be frustrating and is certainly something that Naughty Dog needs to address with a patch. Beyond the enhancements to the base game experience, of course, one of the significant appeals of the remaster is the new game modes. 
It comes with three. Guitar Free Play, Lost Levels, and No Return. Guitar Free Play is a mode crafted for a very specific audience, of which I'm not a part. It looks cool, allowing you to choose between Ellie, Joel, and game composer Gustavo Santolala to play various instruments with various pedals to modify the sound, and to do so in the setting of your choice. You can then adjust the look further with some photo mode style settings. This isn't something I'm going to really touch at all beyond my initial look out of curiosity, but I imagine if you're the kind of person who enjoyed experimenting with the guitar in-game and playing various songs, you'll get more out of this. If that's you, then let me know in the comments what your verdict on the guitar free play mode is. Lost Levels is a very interesting mode, essentially giving you a look under the hood of the development of the game. You have three levels to choose from, all of which are in the state they were in at the point they were cut from the game. The reasons they were cut are apparent quite quickly as they affect the pacing or tone of the game or something in them doesn't work as well as intended. But hearing the developers talk about the intent behind various design decisions, both from a storytelling perspective and in how they try to guide the player towards a certain route or experience, is extremely illuminating. This mode is akin to an interactive version of the deleted scenes in a DVD extras menu, perhaps something players will enjoy once, although the virtual photographers in the community will perhaps spend more time in there. There's no significant replay value here, but that doesn't mean they're not fascinating, and it's certainly something I would welcome more of in the extras menu of games. The more we can demystify the process of making games, the better. I'm sure it won't stop the spiciest of takes that people put on Twitter as engagement bait, but it will allow a lot more people to see through them with greater ease. The biggest, and by far best, addition to the remaster though, is the new No Return mode. A roguelike in which you can play as multiple characters through a randomised run, the replay value here is immense, and it's absurdly addicting. Being purely gameplay focused, and more challenging than the base game, this will not be for everyone. But if you enjoy the gameplay of part 2 and want a new challenge, then there's an awful lot in here for you to enjoy. Especially as, besides the daily run which you only get one shot at, no two runs are the same. The way that a run in No Return works is that you choose a character, or in the case of the daily run a character is chosen for you, and you're presented with a randomised set of scenarios. You have to beat five encounters in order to reach a final boss, and there are four possible paths from the first encounter to the boss. As at two points, you're presented with a choice between two available scenarios. If you die at any point, you fail, and that specific run is lost forever. Each character starts with a unique loadout and unique perks, meaning that there are different advantages and disadvantages to each that suit different playstyles better. As you beat encounters, returning to your hideout, you earn currency, parts, pills, and training manuals. The parts, pills, and training manuals work as they do in the main game. The parts can upgrade your guns, the pills can upgrade your character, and the manuals provide new upgrade paths. As you progress through encounters, one of the pieces of information on your run board is what manual you can earn by beating the encounter, which if you have a choice between two encounters is another factor you must account for when deciding what to do next. You can see the path ahead, including potential encounters and the final boss, which again incentivizes you to make decisions strategically based on what you think you'll need to reach and beat the boss. As part of that, the currency can be used to buy ammo, weapons, recipes, pills or parts in your trading post. What you can buy in the trading post is randomized between encounters, and you can spend currency to roll the dice and re-randomize it once each time. The spending there and then, or saving to buy next time, is a gamble both in terms of what you might get, and whether you can beat this next encounter with what you already have. Beyond this, there are also mods, gambits and dead drops. Mods change up the gameplay, sometimes in your favour and sometimes against. Not every level will have mods, as these are again randomised, or even the negative ones spice up the gameplay in weird ways that add unpredictability and fun to the whole thing. Gambits are specific things you're asked to do in the level for additional reward, which of course might be dangerous to your survival chances. For example, headshotting a grabbed enemy is easy, but can alert the rest to your position, whilst feeding a grabbed enemy to a clicker is fraught with risk. Dead drops are post boxes which ask you to post specific items. Doing so, of course, means that you lose those items, and they may be items crucial to your run, but you will get a reward in return once you're back at your hideout. This can be a new gun, a training manual, or something else, but you don't get to pick, the game does that for you. 
Starting off, you need to play through No Return multiple times, not only to unlock all of the playable characters, each character is unlocked by surviving three or four encounters as the previously unlocked character on the same team, Team Abby and Team Ellie being separate throughout the game, but you will also need to complete multiple gambits and survive multiple encounters with mods to unlock the next level of each until all mods and gambits are unlocked. The daily run is unlocked after nine attempted runs, all of which serves as a good way to ease you into a mode which, whatever difficulty you choose, is decidedly harder than the base game. The gameplay of No Return requires you to lean into all of the deep combat systems of the base game. Playing too slowly and stealthily will lower your score based on time and it isn't possible in certain encounters. Standing and shooting will get you shot down and flanked pretty sharp. You'll need to use stealth, aggression, keeping moving, multiple weapons and thinking on the fly to get through. Especially on the later encounters in the run, with more enemies or where mods make them faster. As I mentioned, this kind of challenge won't be for everyone. But this being Naughty Dog, it's more inclusive than it might otherwise be. All of the difficulty customization and accessibility options from the base game are available. And on top of that, there's a custom run option which allows you to alter all of the variables that each seed generates in order to tailor the experience even more while still keeping it random in the spirit of the roguelike. You can make it easier for yourself, or even harder if you prefer, meaning that even if it's something you're nervous to try, there's a way to ease yourself into it. This won't appeal to those who simply don't want to play this sort of game, but it does mean it's not a mode restricted to more elite players. No Return mode is addictive and has huge replay value. The only two gripes I have with it are, again, minor. One is that every playable character is either wearing Ellie's backpack and holsters, if they're a smaller character, or Abby's, if they're a larger character. And the other is that they all in turn use Ellie or Abby's animations. I can see the logic for this. It allows the developers to focus entirely on the gameplay and level design aspect without having to program in additional animations to the playable characters. In the heat of battle, it doesn't ultimately matter. But it would have been cool for each of them to retain their unique identities in that respect and, in specific reference to Joel, it would have been awesome to be able to play him as you do in part 1 in this part 2 mode. Again, with the melee systems of part 1 being different in multiple significant ways, this would have been a code nightmare, so I can see why they didn't do it. I'm just saying that if they had, it would have been even better. I have seen commentary that the inclusion of the no return mode in the remaster somehow undoes the message in the game about violence being bad. Which is bizarre to me because, for one, it's not G.I. Joe, so there's no knowing is half the battle style moral to the story. And more crucially, the point of Ellie and Abby's narrative arcs and the story overall surrounds the cycle of violence in relation to vengeance and notions that one side is enacting justice in retaliation for the crimes of the other. It's not simply that violence, in all cases, is exactly equivalent and bad. And speaking personally, I don't believe that's a reasonable thing to argue anyway, because in the real world that only serves to tie the hands of people who are oppressed. Add on to that the fact that No Return is non-canon and all about endgame content and further utilising the game's deep combat mechanics rather than trying to add to the story. And to be blunt, I don't see this as undermining the story at all. The extra content, in particular the No Return mode, is in its own right a hell of a lot for the cost of a £10 upgrade to those who already have the game. And if you're buying it for the first time, all these additions just underline that buying the PS5 version rather than the PS4 version is the clear choice here. The Last of Us Part 2 Remastered provides a huge amount of value to veterans and newcomers alike. Let me know if you've played the remaster and what you think of it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like and consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content. Like the video that just popped up, which YouTube thinks you should watch next. This is a Patreon and member supported channel, so if you want to become a member and unlock custom badges and emojis, early access to my videos and your name in the credits, then click the join button below. Thanks very much for watching and see you next time.